Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. It's good to see, well, know you're there. It's good to see the poet's faces and Kaylin's face, um, but it is good to know that you are out there here with us on this chilly evening um, for some perfectly timed po poetry. Um, and I have remarks coming, but I'm just, I feel like I need to say right now, I'm just so grateful um, looking at my screen right now, looking at these beautiful people who have agreed to come and share their their hearts with us and their work um, and to connect in, in ways that we can, the, doing the best we can do right now, right? Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful for you all. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Lisa Viscusi. I'm the manager of adult learning at the Frick Pittsburgh. I am a woman with light skin and dark curly hair. I have on a black top, a black sweater, and a tr I'm wearing a turquoise necklace and hoop earrings. The Frick Pittsburgh occupies ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee, Lenape, Osage, and Shawnee peoples. As a place of history and nature, the Frick recognizes the cultural importance of land and the role of cultural institutions in the formation of collective memory. Displacement and erasure are not just histories for native peoples. Land acknowledgements like historic sites themselves are exercises in preservation and reconciliation engaged with past, present, and future. So just a few things about um, Zooming before we move on. The closed captions are enabled if you wish to uh, to turn them off on your own screen, you have the ability to do that. It's a button that says CC. You can also move the captions around if it's obstructing a view of, of something that you're seeing on your screen that you'd like to see. Um, we will be having, uh, I'm sorry, you're free to drop your, your comments in the chat throughout the program. We're gonna get to any um, questions later. You can put those in the Q&A. Uh, we will hopefully have some time at the end for that. Also, this is being recorded. So if you miss part of it or you want to share it with somebody else, it will be available on the Frick's website on our YouTube channel as well. And I want to welcome Kaylin, our ASL interpreter, for being here with us. Um, thanks so much. Uh, so I am really looking forward to bringing these poets to you as we find ways as we find ways at the Frick, but just I think lately out in the world, um, ways to interpret, appreciate, and communicate visual arts, and by extension, all that we live around us. And so ekphrasis, which is a term used in the title of the program, refers to vivid interpretation, um, often a verbal description, but it can be other, it could be dance, it could be sculpture, um, something that is, is a uh, a, an interpretation of a visual work of art, which is what we're doing this evening. So our poets this evening have spent time in the Frick galleries and we're able to walk through and see all of the, the pieces in our Victorian radical show. And that um, now they're bringing to us what, what moved them and what stirred their language. And so we're here tonight to see and hear their poems, which I'm very excited about, and also to hopefully bring some beauty and inspiration to all of you out there. And um, so now I'm going to ask the poets, hi poets, I love you, um, <laughs> to introduce themselves and also off offer a brief physical description. So I'm going to ask if um, Cam, you'll go first, please. Good evening, everyone. My name is Cameron Barnett. I am a poet and teacher in Pittsburgh. Uh, I am an African American man. Uh, currently, right now, I'm wearing a kind of reddish grape sweater with blue glasses. Thanks, Cam. Uh, Sam? Hi, um, I'm Sam. I'm uh, I published as S. Brooke Quirfman. I'm a 30 year old white person. I'm wearing a green top and a kind of oatmeal sweater over it. I'm sitting in front of my bookshelf and uh, in a window. Thanks, Sam. Veronica? Hello, everyone. I am Veronica Kukuz. I'm a Filipina woman uh, with short, straight black hair to her ears, where I'm wearing silver circular earrings and a gray and white striped scarf. I'm seated in front of a large window and I have a green plant 
over my right shoulder. Thank you. Um, Vanessa. Greetings, my name is Vanessa German. I am coming to you all from unceded Cherokee land in North Carolina, land that was violently taken and people were driven out from unjustly. I am a black woman with brown skin and a heart-shaped face. I am a descendant of enslaved Africans and I am here with the full presence and confidence of all of my ancestors and I send you so much love and peace and grace. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, Amy. Hi everyone, I am Amy Marvel. I am a school psychologist and poet here in Pittsburgh. I am a white woman um, in my mid thirties. I have long straight brown hair and I am wearing like a little quilted cardigan that's keeping me warm tonight. Thanks, Sam. Um, Danielle. Good evening, everyone. My name is Danielle Obisi Orlu. I am the Youth Poet Laureate of Allegheny County and a student at the University of Pittsburgh. I have um, long black braids. I'm wearing red lipstick. I am a dark skinned black woman and I have round glasses and winged eyeliner. Thank you, Danielle. And Michelle. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, and thanks, Lisa and the Frick, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to read with such great poets. Um, I'm Michelle Stoner. I am a white woman with long, straight brown hair and bangs. I'm wearing a black and white striped turtleneck and silver earrings. And um, I'm sitting in my living room with a large green plant behind me as well. Thank you for that, everyone. Um, it's good to hear you describe yourself. Um, there's something special about that too. So I'm gonna share my screen and then we're going to move on to our beautiful poetry readings. Uh, if you'll bear with me for one second. All right. Um, please welcome Sam Korfman. Um, Lisa, do you want me to read the oh, description? Or you... Yes, thank you for that. Oh, I'm sorry. Fine. Actually, if everyone would just give me a quick minute. There we go. Okay, I was having a glitch. Uh, sorry about that. Our first poem is based on the delivery of Israel out of Egypt by Samuel Coleman. It's an oil on canvas painting that refers to the biblical story of Moses and his miraculous dividing of the Red Sea, enabling the Israelites to flee Egypt. So this scene shows the waters closing to drown Pharaoh and his Egyptian army. In the middle distance is the fi a figure of Moses. He's standing on a detached pinnacle of rock with the pillar of fire above him. And but beyond on a level plain above the cliff is the camp of the Israelites. In the foreground is the Egyptian host, um, which is overwhelmed by walls of water. Okay, thank you. Um, can everyone see me and the, I guess I don't have a, Lisa, you're the only person. I'm gonna assume that unless I get a DM saying otherwise that you can both see me and the, <laughs> and the painting see, and the poem. We can see you and the painting, yes. Thank you. Um, so one thing about the, the poems and the image descriptions, I historically have written some ekphrastic poems that are much kind of closer to the painting. They're more really kind of tight descriptions or cre the creation of experiences. Um, and this poem that I wrote ended up kind of expanding. It's a bit more philosophical. Um, and so it incorporates a little bit about why I picked the painting and what happened. Um, but one thing that I want to say that I talk about in the poem, but I'm just, it's kind of the reverse uh, of that image description. So I think it's, um, useful is that I do think the kind of traditional reading of this painting is that the water is kind of going to fall in on the army uh, and that Moses is sort of like halfway between the Israel Israelites on a cliff and and the kind of army. But one thing that happened when I was looking at it is I found the 
those traditional things, the painting kind of moves them differently. Um, the, the time of the painting and the positioning you know, of the different pieces seem to be working slightly differently um, because of like the power of what you can do in a painting maybe and of the kind of compression that it's only one moment. Um, so yeah, so I have sort of in the poem that I'm gonna read slightly different visions of how to understand the, the spatial and the temporal kind of scene that's captured here. Um, okay. So the poem's called uh, The Red Sea. In the snow, I went through the park to the exhibition, hoping to be alone. The snow is like the red or reed sea. It prevents some people from crossing. It creates a dread in those behind. There is an American painter, Samuel Coleman, known for paintings of the Hudson River, and a British painter, Samuel Coleman, known for apocalyptic visions including the delivery of Israel out of Egypt, circa 1820 to 1840, four and a half by six and a half feet in dimension, although I didn't know about either before I arrived. I wanted to write about the women in the exhibit, Medea or Fanny or Persephone or Beatrice or Jane or Kate, and about the intimate, their hands. I thought I would say something about how over time, the face changes. I mean our conception of it, a standard that grows out of individuals. Chins narrow and cheeks lower, which creates a different shape. Because of the paintings, we do not have to decide, except for ourselves, whether they are beautiful, because the paintings tell us they are. But what is left to say about detail? We, lives our li we live our lives in it. It glows when it's right. Uh, I'm gonna break. I just realized I kept tinkering with this poem. So the next couple of bits are slightly different from the version on the PowerPoint. Real live poem reading. Okay. Uh, but what is left to say about detail? We live our lives in it. It glows when it's right. A painting looks real until it steps forward and stays flat. Instead, I stood in front of a painting that you said, that said, you will not be delivered. The cracked oil of the waves. Most things, it turns out, can be somewhat effectively described or reproduced. We expect their actuality to be greater than their approximation, but it isn't, or not by much. A kind of disappointment like the road simply going forward. But sometimes in that gap, you have a different experience. There is more to see. In the book, the painting has high contrast. Because of the brightness of the fire at the center, the edges of the water where the viewer stands are dark. Think of your phone's camera tapping on different parts of the screen to change the focus and how this darkens or brightens the view as a whole and quite differently. But on the wall, the painting is only bright and the fire at the center is brighter, a gradient of illumination. On the wall in the waves, you can see the details, the horses, the soldier on top of the cliff, the jagged lines, the man in the center seen through the red cloth like a screen. In Exodus, the divine has a personified quality, but he does not appear. He talks to Moses, he sends plagues, he moves through natural things, he parts the red or reed sea when Moses raises a hand and then closes it on the pursuing army when Moses raises his hand again. For Coleman, the sea is not important, not red nor full of reeds. Instead, the same force that parts the sea strikes the men and their horses, pushes the water against the cliffs as if simultaneously. There is a trick of perspective. Moses stands on a cliff in the sea ahead of the Israelites, which also puts him in front of them on the shore. I too am a trick of perspective. I am in the gallery, but according to the painting, I am in the sea, struck, touching the bare sea floor. Looking at the painting, I begin to worry abstraction has impoverished my sight. Where before one could look at a wave and see both a wave and a line, sometimes now I can only see the wave. When I see a line, sometimes I can only see a line. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. Everyone, um, please remember you can drop your comments into the chat. Um, next up, we have Michelle Stoner. Madonna, oh, 
Hi, Michelle. <laughs> I'll read the description of the painting. La Donna della Finestra by Dante Gabriel Rossetti depicts a woman seated at a window looking out at the street below. There's an unfinished painting in front of you, a female head with dark chestnut hair. Her face, neck, and hands are finished. Her body is indicated in pencil and chalk outlines. Gold and brown hues make up the background. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I was really compelled by this piece. Um, I, I got home and found myself to be haunted by it, in fact, um, and in, in the best possible way, and uh, dreamt about it and woke up uh, with those great complicated feelings about the poem or about the painting that I knew were going to drive me toward some kind of language. Um, I had in fact not chosen this piece to begin with. And when I got home and kept dwelling on it and then dreamt about it, um, I, I knew that I had to, that this is the one that I um, wanted to respond to. Um, and in fact, it's it to a large degree, it does have to do with the unfinished quality of the piece. Um, what you can't see here is that this orange is, uh, it's the primer for the canvas. So everything about this is uh, unfinished. The, the head and the hands are, um, you know, luxuriously rendered and then everything else is, is just this vibrant orange all the way out to the edges of the painting. Um, and uh, and it, these the, the depth of the hand and the, and the, the head are, are quite well uh, illustrated and then everything else is flat. And um, I just kept, I, I kept not being able to escape that idea. And I really wanted to not only write a, a piece that responded to this, but that also kind of ended up in conversation with it. So um, you'll note one thing that's important to note here is that um, in that the service of it being in conversation, um, one of the lines in the poem is left unfinished um, as the painting is left unfinished. Um, the model in this painting is a woman named Jane Morris who uh, sat for Rossetti often. Um, and uh, so this is sonnet for Jane Morris, unfinished. I could fill in the blanks of your body, elegant, specific, terrified and scarred, the ticking heart neurotic, always needing, needing, the angles curved and posed in expectation, rot and lack. But you are all I wish to be, blazing, androgynous, untethered and bodiless, ample in your abandon not addicted, no disease, just, and blank to the very edges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was really beautiful. This, we were talking um, the other day about this painting and how it just, there is something about that unfinishedness that um, is haunting and beautiful and just draws you in. Um, thank you for this. Um, next, We'll be hearing from Veronica. Hey, hey Lisa, are you gonna? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was waiting to see your face. Oh, am I on camera? <laughs> you are on, you are on. Um, so here you see a bed cover circa 1908 by Mary Jane Newell. In the center of the piece, there is a wide embroidered circle, a sun in the center with sections coming off of the sun of flowers along with the moon an owl, doves and water. The bed cover bordered, uh, border, I'm sorry, is stitched with a quote from William Wordsworth's ode, int intimations of immortality from recollections of, ch of early childhood. And I'll let you go ahead and read that as it's in your piece. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here this evening. It's um, really, truly an honor to be reading among such an incredible um, list of poets. And um, just thanking everyone here in the audience for your presence um, and for your listening ears. I wrote um, two poems. The first one was kind of a process poem that are led me to select the piece by Mary Jane Newell. Uh, and the first piece 
is called After Walking Through the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, or Christiana. Gallery after gallery after gallery, floor after floor after floor, I walk from room to room, face each painted face, get dizzy with monochromatic sanctity, gallery after gallery, floor after floor, the room spins in quiet whiteness, monotone, mono, monotone, I'm unable to stand, white walls in every gallery, on every floor, floor after floor, I am about to fall over onto the floor, face to the floor, visual art vertigo gallery floor, cared for, curated, made sacred century after centuries, frames stuffed full of portraits, portrait of a 25 year old man, portrait of an 18 year old woman, portrait of a young woman, portrait of a lady, portrait of a lady playing a lute, portrait of a woman, portrait of a man, portrait of a young man wearing a red cape and large hat, portrait of a child, portrait of a girl, girl with goat and kid, young girl with a hat, mother and her children in church, virgin and child, virgin, virgin and child, angel, virgin enthroned, angels, virgin adoring infant Christ, to angels, virgin and child, virgin, virgin of the Annunciation, the Annunciation, the Adoration, the coronation, Christ in a landscape, a permanent collection. And so having had that experience um, just last fall, it was the first time I'd entered into a museum space in almost two years. Um, I really gravitated towards the work um, that did not have any human representation. Um, and so, this piece is, is about the size of a full-size bed. It's square and it's beautifully placed under a stained glass window that Mary Jane Newell also created that had these kind of medieval boats um, in front of a castle. And, um, and so the, the words around the trim um, are from the William Wordsworth poem. And these are the lines. The rainbow comes and goes, and lovely is the rose. The moon doth with delight look round her when the heavens are bare. Waters on a starry night are beautiful and fair. The sunshine is a glorious birth. And this poem is Ode. Ode to respite, Ode to the bed and to the body, ode to the fingers and the thread, ode to the fingertips that may have bled, ode to the chain stitch, ode to the stem, ode to the straight, long, short, and knot, ode to the finger and thread, ode to the wool and the lamb, ode to the dyes and the wind, ode to the little roses, ode to the owl, ode to the double O in look, looped like two wedding rings, ode to the sun in the center, ode to the poem and poet, ode to the sparrows and the bees, ode to the butterflies and water shimmers, ode to the waxing crescent moon, ode to the dogwood or dog rose, the scarlet pimpernel, ode to the pulsing heart, ode to the pulsing heart, ode to the rainbows and rainbows and rainbows and respite. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica. That was amazing. I love that you had the part one and part two and that you had done an exercise similar to this um, when you were first able to, to go to a museum. It's, it's something you forget that you can do, I think, after you know this many years almost. Um, and so there's something special about going back in, which um, I hope some, some of you, if not all of you, have been able to experience safely. Um, next, we have Cam Barnett who will be um, reading his poem, The Pipe Bearer. 
So in front of you, you see the painting, The Pipe Bearer by John Frederick Lewis. It's an oil on wood painting. It's the study of a black Nubian servant wearing North African dress and holding a hookah. The image shows the artist's interest in facial aspects and expression, as well as the positions of different ethnic groups um, occupied within upper class Egyptian households. So shown in profile is uh, the main figure's head is compared to a lighter skinned man behind him and, cost, uh, and the costume elements are carefully recorded. Whenever you're ready, Cam. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and just to echo those before me, um, thank you for having me and for everyone joining us tonight. Um, so when I visited the exhibit at the Frick, um, I too hadn't been to a museum in quite some time because of the pandemic. Um, and I went through and I decided I'm gonna look at every single piece in here. Um, Victorian culture and art is not something that I typically engage with or feel very familiar with. So I wanted to really uh, steep myself in it. Um, and right off the bat, I went to two paintings that had black figures in them. Um, the name of the first one slips in my mind right now, but the second one, the pipe bearer is what really kind of brought me back. Um, the poem, if you see on the screen, has a large diagonal um, rift through it, which is, um, as you'll hear, supposed to sort of uh, represent and reflect the positioning of the two figures in the painting. Um, and one other thing I'll say about this, those of you who may have had a chance to see the exhibit or, or still could, um, what's not present in the painting is, and is present in my poem is a lot of the conversation around the curation of the exhibit, all of the pieces, um, the materialism, the craft, the sensibility of the era. I was really trying to take in everything that I was experiencing, but really bring it back to this one painting that I couldn't escape. So I'll say that. Uh, this poem is called Second Look, The Pipe Bearer. How do you change the world? A slow soak of oil, history is like that, and a glance finds so much familiar. A century of new hues slathered onto wood. That's process. Take a second look. Staff in hand, white power clenched, clean jaw of black youth tilted, and race breaks diagonal between them. Progress. Take a second look. A semblance of symmetry saved by the far corner. East could be anywhere as long as it's not here. Would that he say something of lips and their lies. Now that's radical. A brushstroke is process. What's left behind is progress. So hard not to confuse object and subject. Take a second to look. Would that the jambaya slip its scabbard to cut off the breath the paternal posturing, are both not pretenders. Stare meets process, meets progress, meets deviation. Both sets of eyes to the West, some south of shame, some south of skepticism and hope. One brings, another consumes radically. The old gold frame holding it together, but its cracks betray the breaking. How else do you change the world? It takes a second to look. East is not anywhere centered. Radical, indirect, emotionless gazes. What would the pipe say of this voyeurism in garb and grasp, of the failure to grasp the blackness before him? That ain't radical. Would that the walls fail, the pipe tumble, the eyes level and meet to see what's really there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cam. Um, I love that this, that your poem sort of meets the, the fact that we're looking at visual art um, and the arrangement of the words and um, on the page can sort of echo what you see in the, in the art hung on the walls. Um, it's something that I love about this process, the ekphrasis process, the ekphrastic process, excuse me. Um, so thank you very much. And next we have Amy. Hi, Amy. I'll just read the description quickly. 
Morgan Le Fay by Frederick Sands is one of a series of single feature paintings depicting beautiful, powerful, and dangerous women that he produced in the 1860s. In Thomas Mallory's Mort d'Arthur, Dartour uh, from 1485, King Arthur's half-sister Morgan Le Fay, which means uh, the fairy, attempts to murder him <laughs> with an enchanted garment that she has woven herself. So design, um, it's designed to consume with fire anyone who puts, on, uh, puts it on. So here she is seen beside her loom, chanting an incantation over the fatal robe. Her appearance in the picture with her loose hair along with her strong movements and draped leopard skin around her body suggests a dangerous female sexuality. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm so thankful to be here. And I was really drawn to this painting initially just for the colors. I love that color green and the bright yellow. Um, but once I read the description, I became enthralled with this Morgan Le Fay character. I wasn't very um, familiar with the King Arthur tales, but I did start researching Morgan. And what really struck me was this idea when she first showed up in these stories, she was a healer and she was so intelligent and very caring. And it seemed that as more men got a hold of her to tell her story and to retell her story, she became this villain and this seductress and this um, witch. And so I kind of wanted to take back her story. Um, and I had a lot of fun imagining um, what she would say uh, about herself and about this painting. So this is an incantation for fire. It starts with his fist, a rib, a bed trick. It starts at a trope, the sword, the stake. It starts with a silencing. With blood between the legs, it begins at the end of a rope. Then the stirring, a finger strike on the knife edge of need, a want that writhes. Next a loom, a locked room, Stories that twist over time. There's a beast's heart from the battlefield. Heat pulled from an angry throat. There are two scorched eyes, a simmering violence. There are no men apologizing. There's soft tongue, shape of shame, stench of sex, finally flame. And he is no match. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amy. I love that. I, I feel like the this incantation that you wrote strikes out like the the visuals in this painting, which I I love. Um, and there's so much so much detail as there is in the painting. So thank you so much. Um, thanks for being here and for that. Um, next we have Danielle, and I will read this description for you, Danielle. The stone breaker that you see in front of you here is um, an 1857 oil on canvas painting by Henry Wallace, depicting an outraged critique of the treatment of the poor in Victorian England. The painting here shows a male figure sitting by a pile of small stones. His eyes are closed and his hammer is motionless on the ground. Under the Poor Law Amendment Act of 1834, those unable to find other employment were often condemned to breaking stones to create road surfaces, which was exhausting and dangerous work. Only gradually as we look at this piece do we realize that the man is not sleeping, but dead. His body is so still and cold that a stoat dares to climb onto his ankle. You have to look very closely to see it, but it's there. In, in it, the painting's deep tones, um, it is a requiem to the forgotten victims of the industrial age. Danielle? Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I first chose this poem. I initially wanted um, a symbol. You know, I think tangible objects, even though paintings are tangible, are things that are very easy to write poems about. I was looking at vases and different objects that I could get a hold of and turn into because I feel like a poem already has a poem, a painting already has an identity. But since I'm a university student and I study migration, I was looking for something that I could look back to 
a time where it wasn't as busy, I was able to rest. And when I first saw this poem, I initially thought, oh, he's resting, you know? And I also had a thought that, oh, there's rest, you're figuring out your time. And then you realize that it's too quiet. It is too still. There is too much of something and you can't really put your finger on it. And it is the lack of life, the lack of rest, um, which was this um, figure's entire life. So I was really interested in exploring that. And in terms of my work, in terms of looking at migration with a lot of internal migration, you have a lot of people leaving their households, a lot of men leaving their households, and then you have women headed households. And they always wonder what happened, you know, in the women headed households. So now I was really interested in taking this painting from the perspective of, you know, somebody who was this stonebreaker's beloved, um, asking questions and basically speaking speaking out his eulogy. So I hope you enjoy. And this poem is called Stonebreaker, My Beloved. In the distance, the bells do toll to mark the end of day. Life itself shivers off the cold in hopes of finding pleasure amidst the languid dismay, but beyond the horizon, beneath the forgotten trees, tempted by the sweetness of rest, my beloved, lives only with himself to please. Spirits surround him to dance upon his gentle breath, waiting in mischief for when he wakes. Branches caress his calloused hands while flowers of dust bloom from his fingertips. My beloved has lived for labor, seduced by its longing calls at break of day. He always answers, a message bearer for the dawn. Stonebreaker, they call him, his name misplaced beneath the rubble promise bearer, ground creator, my laborer of an age long forgotten. My beloved was a gentle medicine. Where men were cast as poisons, his remedy clearly marked yielder of concrete fruit, your back now crooked and contorted by laws of retribution. What did you dream of, stonebreaker? As you now revel in rest, did history retrieve your name or cast you off as a spectacle of light and dust stone breaker? You wear the robes of a life stolen from exhaustion. All I wish to do is tilt your head towards the horizon. Stone breaker, you cannot see, but the yellow creeps through the jealous blue to find a suitable home for stone breaker, my beloved. Bear no more heavy labor. City carrier, future bringer, fear not what the stillness calls for endless rest has found you. Stonebreaker, my beloved, listen to the wind. It has found your true name. It has called you to life. Thank you. Danielle, you can't see me, but I'm sending you snaps right now. Thank you so much. I, I just, that was, you looked so deeply into this, this painting that I, I just, you, I think no, most people don't. So you look past its 17 layers <laughs> into new life, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and finally, we have Vanessa German. Hi, Vanessa. Hi. Hi, I'm going to quickly read this um, description. This floor length day dress that you see on the screen circa 1865 is a green and black striped silk with black ribbon and braid and cord trim. It's both machine and hand stitched. It's a typical dress for upper and middle class women of the Victorian era. The garments green and black reflects the discovery in the late 1850s of an, um, aniline dyes, which had an enduring impact both on textiles and dress um, and on the development of synthetic pigments for paint. So with that, Vanessa. Thank you. 
my mother was a fiber artist and I spent a lot of my life watching her touch fabric. And I always wondered, um, and she would touch fabric so reverently, so clearly in communication with it that I wondered what was happening. And as a maker, I understand what was happening now. So this dress inspired my mother's, um, these visions of my mother's dressmaking and these visions of, um, and understandings of things that my mother taught me that, um, that her life taught me and her being taught me. Green dress. The bodiless body floats two or three inches above the living room floor. She is a haunting ghost-like thing. If you come into the room at midnight, she will stop your breath in your throat and you will have to catch yourself back into this reality once you see the hymn and recognize the hipless skirt. You might giggle at your own fright. My mother tests the silk against her open palm. Her hands over the cloth make the sound of a small ocean lapping at its folds. A girl can get lost in a simple box pleat if you let her keep it up, my mother is teaching me how to read the story of the life of the fabric. Keep it up, she says. I am stroking the short pattern between two open palms, green and black stripes, praying into the cloth that it gives up its secrets. My mother says, see, your fingers know what is happening. Here is about listening, she says. This is a listening gown and this sound. Your open palms against the material. This is a song about finding your own name in the weave and in the weft. It's a time traveling thing. Go there, an ear cocked to the edges of the known universe. If you listen closely to the cloth, you can call something true to walk towards you to be known. She says, that's what a maker does. She says, if you listen closely to the material, you can hear the chatter of the silkworms singing work songs in the weft from when they spun this thread into existence. You'd have thought she was speaking about just one single thread of hundreds and thousands that sweep and tuck and rise up around the breast and fall down then in an elegant sigh to the jaunty bounce of a wide hymn. What she and the bodiless body are teaching me is that everything is listening. Everything is animate. Everything is awake and is alive and is keeping its own record. So be careful, my mother tells me. Be humble in this discourse. You are not just looking at a gown, touching the material of the bodiless body. You are not just looking at a gown, touching the material. The gown is also looking back at you. Let yourself be seen. This is what makers do. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been such an honor to hear everyone and um, to be held in this group of words and objects. It's really deeply humbling and I'm grateful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And thank you for, in this work, reminding us the life and energy and history that is in every object or any object, any human, anything around us, um, I think can draw out this beauty if we let it. Um, so I'm going to ask you to stay on screen. I'm going to stop, share, and come back. And I'm going to invite um, every all of our poets to come back. Hello, everyone. Is everyone relieved now? <laughs> we can go to bed without worrying tonight. Um, the life of a writer. I, this was, um, this was so beautiful. It was an, uh, it was an homage to the, to the show, I would say, but to so, so much more. And it, it just means so much to me to bring artists and poets together um, because we, I feel that there is a language spoken that 
isn't necessarily spoken in other places or um, that people don't hear. And so I'm grateful for you, for your voices and your, in your hearts again. Um, so if everyone, I see some comments in the chat and if there are any questions in there, we'll, we'll get to them. But um, so if anyone has any questions, you can put them in Q and A or the chat, we'll get them. Um, but in the meantime, I'm gonna throw a question out to our poets. Um, and you did answer some of them when you were introing. So if I if I'm being a little redundant, I apologize. But did you? It's I'm thinking of Danielle's reading um, in particular about this question. But did you have a new or different understanding of the work once you wrote what you wrote? Um, even maybe after reading it, did it sort of something change um, in your understanding of it? No, that's a great question. Thank you so much. I yeah. think when I initially looked at it, like I said, I was just like, oof, rest. I want to be able to rest before an incredibly yeah. hectic semester with so many things going on. And the poem fell out really quickly because I think Stonebreaker has such a rhythm to it. Mm. And then as I was writing it, I was hearing the cracking of stones behind me. I was, I was like, oh, okay, I understand. Okay but like the people who are doing all of this work are also just people existing within their circumstance they can't necessarily change but now they're subjugated to to work that is hard and cruel and dangerous mm -hmm. and there are other people waiting for them eventually because you have to I'm looking at it from like a poli sci kind of yeah. mindset where you know you have Inter or demography, you have internal migration in order to, to meet some socioeconomic needs. And I wrote it from a very, a very quick and lyrical perspective. And then I was looking at it and I, I think me writing this was, is really a commentary of how we cannot continue to exist in this cycle where we will work people or communities to the point of exhaustion and then say, oh no, there, there will be rest after. Because the rest that one group gets after is the pain that another group will feel at the end of the day. Yeah. So I think my understanding was that, you know, love is continuous because I love love. Love is continuous regardless in, in life and death. And there is rest in both life and death. But the only, it shouldn't be that the only time you should be able to rest is when you are at the point of brink or at the point of exhaustion or death. It's a great interpretation of that. Love that. I love that you all investigated that. That's something else I love about this process because I would love to do the same if I were to, you know, write something. So I, I think that's part of the the connection. Um, so thank you for all of your investigations. Um, does anyone else have anything about what your um, your thoughts were after, um, or your your new understanding of your of your work or of the work? Um, for me, one of the things that happens is I think that like so much of looking at the art in the exhibit is this, you know, it can prompt its own thoughts, but, um, but it's hard to like hold them together as thoughts, like until you're writing, like there's something that happens when you start writing about it, then you can start to like find the details for me. And so like a lot of what I ended up thinking about, which was like, well, the, you know, they're supposed to, the light of God is supposed to like be pushing away the, pushing away the water. And then it's supposed to be like pushing the water back. And in the painting, it's like sort of happening at the same time. That didn't really, I mean, I sort of understood the effects of the perspective of the, like I'm in here, but I didn't quite articulate it. It wasn't until I was writing that I was able to sort of articulate that thing. Yeah. And so this is a little bit um kind of of what Danielle was saying about the you know, once you're in it and you can hear the rhythm and like something comes out of that, of like whatever's happening kind of behind you. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that happened for me is that I had this experience of looking at the painting and I was also kind of haunted by it. Um, like Michelle, where it was maybe not the first painting I was gonna pick originally, that's a little in the poem. And then as I was writing, I was sort of able to name some of the things that were happening that um, were affecting me, but I didn't actually, when I was just looking and wasn't writing, I don't know that I would have been able to tell you mm -hmm. what had happened. So they sort of get articulated only because I started writing the right. poem. 
So what, um, well, has there, had anyone not done ekphrasis before? It was this your first time? I think everyone, well, now you're, now you're in it. So I see you. Um, so how is, maybe talk about the ekphrastic process. Um, is it, how is it different from other processes maybe, or what do you like about it? I think for me, what is, what was so different is when I, I mean, when I usually write, I'm writing about myself and my own experiences. And this process really allowed me to get out of myself mm -hmm. and imagine something else. Um, and that's not something I typically do when I'm writing. So it was, it was a nice, it was a practice for me. It was a nice practice. Um, and I really appreciated it. And I think that um, I, I don't do it often, but it's something that I am looking forward to doing more because it was, it was enjoyable. Good. Good. That's why we bring shows in so that poets can write. That's really the reason, right? Right, Dawn? I don't know if she's there, but, <laughs> um, anyone else want to talk about the ekphrastic process? Um, for me, it was really interesting because I don't typically write in form. Um, I love a sonnet, uh, Wanda Coleman's American Sonnets. I love, uh, I love them, but I don't often, I'm, I'm a more of a free form kind of person. Um, and there was something about the, the expansiveness of this unfinished painting that I loved so much that ended up um, almost for me requiring the form in order to contain my, the, the, the expansive feelings that I was having about it. I ended up really relying on the, on the form of the sonnet to, um, to help me wrangle all of the language that I, that, you know, kept piling up for me. And that was a very cool process that, that the, the, the nature, uh, the unrestricted nature of the painting ended up informing me to write a, a restrictive poem. Um, and so that, I, I don't know, there was, that's really all I have to say about it, but it was, it was a very interesting thing to have happen. Good. It makes sense. It doesn't make sense, but it makes sense. <laughs> I can also add to that. Um, and also before I forget, I just wanna say thank you to Kaylin, our ASL interpreter for doing a great job tonight. Um, but, I I haven't done a proper ekphrasis in a while, so I was honestly kind of nervous about the project because I had the sort of expectation that I needed to create something that, while tethered to the source material, mm -hmm. was fully separate. Um, and as I said before I read my piece, I kind of went in with an interrogative, inquisitive sort of mind. And all my notes and all my sort of like first little scribblings kind of were set in that place. And I was finding it hard to kind of move to what I thought needed to be like the next spot. And it took a little time for me to kind of settle on the idea that like the interrogation is the art. Um, I, I kind of feel like my piece ended up being conversation uh, mm -hmm. ekphrasis rather than sort of like a, a sort of second thing standing next to the other thing if that makes any sense at all but yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is like I, I kind of just got really wrapped up in sort of questioning the art within the space within the idea within you know kind of the nesting dolls of art yeah I love that you brought in the, the frame I think a couple of people did um because it is it's like you you're hyper focused on the work but then you start looking out and out and out even like what building it's in and who pays for the building and what city it's like, you sort of can go out, out um, from there, which I, I, it was definitely clear in your, in your work. Love that. Anyone else? Well, if, uh, again, how about last chance, if anyone has any questions or comments, you can throw them in the chat. And I'm going to ask all of our poets, if you're interested, um, if there's a way for people to um, read your work or learn more about you or buy your your books cam we were talking about earlier um or buy any of your work you please throw it in the chat um 
And if you have, if anyone out there has questions about that, you're welcome to um, call the Frick and get in touch with me and I will connect you with these, these beautiful poets. Um, all right. Well, unless there's anything else, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have so much more to say, but I, I want to just send you my love and, and positivity. And um, I think it's such a, just a beautiful expression of, um, of the creativity that lives right here with us in the city. And I, I'm overwhelmed often um, when I meet and talk to people um, such as yourself and um, the people that I work with every day. And it's just, thank you. And uh, also Vanessa's installation is still on view at the Frick. Um, Reckoning Grief and Light, and she is a artist in residence at the Frick for uh, another few years, two years. Um, so, and Victorian Radicals closes tomorrow. So, if you are out there and you have not seen it or you want to see it one more time, please come and visit. Um, it's it's stunning. Whether you're into it or not, it's visually stunning. <laughs> so, uh, um, I'm sorry. Did I say yeah? The closes Sunday. I'm sorry. It closes on Sunday. I saw someone say in the chat, it closes tomorrow. I was like, that's not right. Sorry, Dawn. Yeah, it closes Sunday. <laughs> Never mind. So please come and see it. Um, and I will leave you with that. And thank you for, for being with us tonight. We made it an hour. Sending love to everyone. Thank you. You can listen again on the Frick's YouTube ch channel and on our website. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Thanks, everyone. Stay warm.